Yeah. Wonderful. Well, very good morning to you. What a joy to be together. Even, again, I find the, the silence before very odd, but we praise God that we can gather. Welcome to you on the live stream. Uh, again, I trust it's working. Um, it's good to be together. It's good to be here to praise and worship our great God and to hear from his word. I'm very grateful that my dad has come to preach for us later on from Matthew 2. So we very much look forward to hearing what God is going to say uh, through that passage, through that. Um, you may have noticed that there were some bags on the table on your way in. That's because uh, Lawrence and Elizabeth have kindly between them prepared um, the first of the year card and the prayer card for this coming year. Um, they're well wrapped up so that you can um, look after it and store it for 72 hours or whatever you need to do. Um, but do grab one of those on your way out and um, make use of them, praise God. Um, next week we will be looking at that verse from Lamentations, which I think is tremendously exciting and a great verse to be remembering this year. Let me pray as we begin. We rejoice, O oh God, that you have called us to be your people. Your dearly beloved children, rescued and redeemed by your Son. And so we glory that we can worship you together, even if some of us are at home and some of us are here but separate. We delight in you, our God. And we pray that you would help us to worship you rightly this morning. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and we're going to start by saying these words from Luke 2 together. So do stand and let's say together. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favour rests. Wonderful. But do have a seat. Sorry, it feels a bit like jump up, jump down, but um, it's good to be active and part of it. We're going to come to a time of confession, recognising that God has his favour on those who are in Jesus, that we are fully forgiven, rescued, righteous in God's eyes through Jesus. Um, but it's good for us, it's good for our souls and our hearts to come before the Lord and to acknowledge our sin. And so in a moment we're going to pray these words together, but just a chance to reflect on the words and to confess before our Lord.
wonderful world. If these are true for you, then do join in together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive what we have been, help us to amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Well, Paul reminds us, as we were thinking about on uh, Friday, on Christmas Day, of this glorious saying, uh, this saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Let that truth just warm your heart. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's why he came. He came for you and for me. And we're going to rejoice in him, our wonderful King, as we're going to join in with humming, crown him with many crowns. Um, so we're going to join in with the video which will be on the screen. Um, do stand and let's hum along. <laughs>
come to a time of prayer now. Let me start by reading some words from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's pray. We do praise you, Jesus, that you are God and have always been God. That you were there in the beginning, that through you all things were made. You are glorious, you are wonderful. We praise you that you did not uh, step back from our world, but you stepped into our world. We praise you that you took on human flesh, becoming a little baby, that the light does shine in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we rejoice that was true in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, and we rejoice it's true in Percival Point today that you are the light of the world and the darkness cannot overcome your light. We praise you, Jesus, that you are so good. Please help us to better grasp your love for us. Help us to grasp how high, how wide, how long and deep is your love for us. Please help us to grow to know you better, to delight in you more and more. Please do help us to want to grow in our faith, to want to grow in maturity, to accept your discipline and be ready to grow. Please do shape and transform us, we pray, to be more like Jesus. Father, we do pray and bring before you any of our congregation who are struggling, whether that's obvious or not. We do pray for those who haven't come to church for a very long time, we think of Dick and Janet, and we pray that you would keep them, you would be their shepherd and hold on to them. Would you hold them fast? We pray for those we have seen, but perhaps uh, less frequently recently, or those who are, who are more stuck at home. Father, please comfort and encourage them. Please would each one of us look to you, Jesus, would we know that you are working good for us and through us? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for our village and for the way you have kept us and blessed us here. Thank you that uh, it is a lovely place to live. Thank you that you've given us other believers here who can encourage us and we can encourage. Thank you for our community, even if it's feels a bit lacking at this time. Thank you for our shops and schools locally. Thank you for the friends we have in this village. And we pray that you would be at work in this village. We pray particularly, Heavenly Father, that you would be rescuing the lost. Oh, how we pray that you would be using this pandemic not just uh, to grow and disciple your, your faithful believers, but also to rescue unbelievers to new life in Christ. And we pray for those in our village who don't know you, the many who, as far as we know, are currently walking to their doom. Father, we pray that you would rescue, we pray you would intervene, we pray you would give us opportunities to share something of the good news, we pray that you would work mightily by your spirit, bringing revival in individual hearts, bringing people to know Christ, to be rescued and redeemed, to be your people. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Please would that be true for our day in this village, we pray. Would those walking in darkness see the great light of Jesus and so be rescued. Please do help us to know what it looks like to engage and care for those around us in this time. 
Give us great wisdom to know what it means to love people in this time. Help us know when to step back and when to step in. Help us to care for one another. Help us to keep going with those things we find hard. Thank you, God, that you are the one who cares ultimately, who is the great rescuer. Thank you that you sent Jesus for us. Thank you that you sent Christ Jesus into this world to save sinners. So we pray all these things in his wonderful name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together. Do join in. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Right, in a moment, uh, Mark is going to come and read uh, Matthew 2, verses 1 to 18 for us. That's page 966 in the Red Bibles. And then straight after that, uh, Dad's going to come and preach. Matthew chapter 2, on page 966. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 2 and verses 1 to 18. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. And, having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. 
When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Rama, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. <clears throat> it's lovely to be with you. It seems a very long time since we've been here in person. Um, I don't remember when it was, uh, but we have actually been with you virtually, practically throughout lockdown, because we've uh, used David's service uh, again and again. So even though we haven't really been with you physically, we have enjoyed very much being together with you in terms of what we've been learning through the Lord. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this famous passage which we know so well. Please, even though we know it well, show us new things out of your law that we can take to heart and put into practice in our lives and, and show us things more about yourself too. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a very, very well-known story, and I don't know how many times each of us will have heard it read and, and uh, thought that normally next Sunday, I think. But, but I thought it would be good to look at it, because the trouble with these famous stories that we know so well, they're sort of overlaid by all the pictures of the magi in front of the infant in the manger, the... Uh, the camels on the Christmas card, and so on. Uh, and, and, and really, I think there's, there is stuff there that we need to look at, and sometimes a fresh look is no bad idea. And you can already see my first heading. I'm going to ask two questions of the passage. And the first is, what does the story tell about Jesus? And then the second is... What does it tell us about ourselves as we respond to Jesus? Two, two questions. What, first, what does it tell us about Jesus? Otto the Third. Let me just uh, show you a picture of Otto the Third. He lived in the 10th century, so a long time ago. Um, and he succeeded his father as king of the Germans at the age of three when his father, who had the uh, original name of Otto II, he died campaigning in Italy. And so on Christmas Day 983, Otto III was crowned King of Germany with all due pomp and ceremony. Though actually it was his mother who ruled for the net until he was 16. And when he was 16, he was crowned by the Pope in Rome as Holy Roman Emperor. And uh, you can see a picture of his crown there. And I tell you all that because it just gives us a contrast with our baby Lord Jesus, also the King, a much greater King. Whereas Otto was brought up in enormous wealth and splendour in the palace, Jesus was living in a simple house in the little town of Bethlehem. And you see from the story, the wise men came expecting to find him at the palace in Jerusalem. But that's not where he was. It is what you would expect for a king. But our Lord Jesus, although he came from all the glories of heaven, Glory is far beyond anything that any earthly king would experience and know. 
he came and lived humbly as he was born humbly in a stable but now living in a house it seems as the wise men arrive. Paul wrote of him his famous words, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is Jesus, a humble king. We learn next that he was the king of the Jews. That was the title that the uh, wise men gave him as they came to Herod inquiring about him. It, that title just comes once more in Matthew. Gospel. And I wonder whether you remember where it was. You probably do. It was what Pilate caused to be written over the cross. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Matthew uses it at one end and the other of his Gospel. He's using it to tell us that he was indeed to be the King of the Jews, the, the Lord of his uh, the the, the people that God had chosen. But of course, when the Magi come, when the wise men come, they come as Gentiles from far away, so, so we know that he's not just king of the Jews, he's king of all the nations of the world. But actually, I think Matthew was signalling when he uses this title here, and then again about the cross, that this baby this baby Jesus was born to die. And by dying, God's great salvation plan, which we can see unfolding in everything that's being ordained and worked out through this story, and then on into his life. The salvation plan was being fulfilled at this moment and brought to reality. And how much we should rejoice in this, that Jesus was a king born to die. And then we see that the baby in Bethlehem was the Lord God himself. And we see that in the word worship. The word worship is used three times. It's used first as what the Magi say they are coming to do to the, the king of the Jews that they are looking for. The word that Herod repeats when he claims that he will go to worship him. But it's the word that Matthew uses when he describes how these, these men from so far away fall down before a little baby and worship him. And I, I couldn't help think, thinking, there is David and Emma's little son, about the age, probably between one and two, that the Lord Jesus was at this moment, and these great figures with their treasure falling down before this little baby, who would look like any other little baby, and yet was truly the King of all the world, our great King Jesus, who is God himself. And the word worship tells us that, doesn't it? Jesus actually picked up on that word worship when he was talking to the devil. Do you remember what the devil said to him? He said, he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and he said, all this I will give you if you bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Only God is to be worshipped. So the word worship has that significance. Matthew is signalling to us this is truly God himself come down to be amongst us. So we learn these three things about Jesus. Humble, he's born to die, and he's the Lord God himself. And the, the question that the passage asks us, and it and I think it's a very relevant one, whatever our situation is, how do we respond? How do we respond to that Jesus who came? 
And I'm going to look at three responses that we find in this passage. And the first is the perhaps obvious one of Herod. And here's a picture of Herod. Um, at least they think it's probably Herod. And his response is to feel threatened. Herod had reigned for over 30 years at this point, and he carried out an enormous building program. We've been to Israel three times now, and, and you see signs of his great projects. He was a huge uh, builder, and of course he's famous particularly of you can still see the stones of the Temple Mount, though the actual temple itself was, was destroyed. But he built this great, really glorious temple in Jerusalem. And like many rulers of his time, but also today, he used his power to further his own ends and woe betide you if you got in the way. And like many other rulers, he feared plots to undermine and overthrow him. And in his determination to eliminate all, all rivals to the throne, he actually ended up killing three of his sons and, and one of his wives. Um, and that makes us realise that the story of the, 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 the passage ends with, of his killing of those, and, and, and it, those little boys in Bethlehem, and what a, a dreadful thing that was. That was very much in his character. But it arose out of this fear, this fear that he was going to be challenged by a new king. This baby in Bethlehem. And it's very easy to look at Herod and think, put him on a pedestal and think, oh Herod, yes, wicked Herod. But I want us to reflect on how we sometimes feel threatened by things, because I believe that is a reality for many of us. Human pride is at the root of so much that's wrong with us, and we hate to see what we take pride in humbled or despised. We hate to see other people succeed where we struggle. How easy it is to react when someone comes along who does something better than we can do it, and we start feeling sidelined. When something seems to threaten what we hold dear, we can react very strongly. And I think it's one of the main things that can, can keep us from turning to Christ in the first place. Nothing that comes from us alone, where Jesus is excluded, which does not depend on him, is of any worth. Our pride, the things that we, we hold so dear, can often get in the way of trusting him and looking to him for the strength and help to be what he wants us to be. I like this song which conjures up some of this, that are what I've been talking about. All I once held dear built my life upon, all this world reveres, and wars to own, which is exactly what Herod was doing. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this, compared to what? Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you. There is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best, you're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Good if you can sing it. <laughs> and we're all tarred with this brush and need to repent of our tendency to defend everything built on our pride and self reliance. Let's learn from Herod. And who else do we see responding in this passage? Well, we easily miss the chief priests and the teachers of the law. When consulted by Herod, did you notice they're very quick to turn up Micah? They know exactly where to, to find it in the scrolls. And they tell Herod, and then through him, the wise men are told where Messiah was to be born, and that was in Bethlehem. But did you notice they don't make any attempt?
attempt to go and find him themselves, they show absolutely no interest in finding the Messiah for themselves. They don't seem to want to, to show him either and welcome him. And here are people who know their scriptures. And I think this is a warning to us, you know, we're people of the Bible, but they were. They knew the scriptures. And and Jesus met people like that in his later life, didn't he? Do you remember what he said to some of them? He said, you study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. These are the very scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And isn't that exactly what these people were doing? They refused to come to him, the, the young Jesus. They had no interest. And why do you think that uh, that was so? I don't know if you know the musical Fiddler on the Roof. Um, it tells the story of Teddy, the milkman, and his family. And one of the great songs of the show is Tradition! Uh, And it reflects the fact that these Jewish people living in Russia in the early years of the 20th century had lives very much bound up by traditions. Traditions about how you eat, how you dress, and especially about whom you marry uh, and how a marriage is brought about. They had these uh, ladies who were um, called matchmakers who went around arranging marriages. And of course it's out of the question to marry uh, somebody who's not a Jew. Uh, And the story very much concerns itself with the challenges they begin to face uh, against their traditions. And I think the main reason why the chief priests and the teachers of the law won't come to Jesus is they're bound up in their traditions and their traditional roles of power. And again, before we start thinking these wicked, dreadful people, just remind ourselves that Traditions can be part of our lives too. And the trouble is we can't see them. It's a bit like putting your glasses on and forgetting you've got them on. <laughs> you've actually got your glasses on, they change the way you see the world, but you, you, you're not aware of it. And so you see everything through that lens. And, and, and we all have these, uh, these traditions. There are those of us who like the old traditional hymns particularly, and we're not too keen or some of the uh, happy, trappy ones today. And then there are people the other way around, aren't there, who, who love all the modern hymns and can't really cope with, with uh, some of the more traditional ones. And music, of course, is a great area for traditions and, and conflict that arises out of it. Um, and then you get the people like the Prayer Book Society who only want to have the Book of Common Prayer and don't want to use a modern service, that's in the Church of England, and then you get the people who will only use the, the King James Bible because the modern versions aren't any good, and vice versa. And, and, and then you've, you've got the people who don't fit in with the way we think you ought to be, you know, um, our sort of middle-class values, the people who wear clothes that seem odd to us and have tattoos and body piercing. You, well, you could fill in all sorts of descriptions of the people that we don't <coughs> naturally relate to. And these, this is all part of our traditions, the people we wouldn't want to know. And, and yes, we're called to be different from that, but how easy it is to be uh, prejudiced in different ways by the traditions of our upbringing and, and, and everything else. And I just point to, as, as I conclude this bit, that Barry and Joseph were a young Jewish couple who would have been brought up never to uh, allow a Gentile to come into their home. That would have been the accepted way of, of, of living. And yet, they have no hesitation, it seems, in welcoming those, those people from the East into their home and allowing them access to their child to bow down and worship him. Now, that shows a willingness to see beyond the traditions, which you don't find with the teachers of the law and, and, and the high priests. So, 
Do you see the responses we've seen feeling threatened? A response bound by tradition. Sorry, I think I've missed. So, and then the third one we're going to look at is obedient, joyful, and trusting. And that's the wise men and the magi coming from the East. And it's just remarkable. It's such a remarkable story. You know it so well. It is remarkable. Here are these people coming from probably from Persia or somewhere like that where there was a great tradition of astronomy and astrology, of, of looking at stars and finding meaning there. And they see a new star. By God's grace, they become convinced that this is something so significant they can't miss it. And they embark on a long and costly journey obeying God's summons through the star. And it seems quite possible that they first saw the star when Jesus was born. And it, you know, getting organised and coming all that distance has taken them all this time because the fact that Herod killed all the big boys under the two suggests that by the time they got there it was probably well after he was one anyway. And then they don't give up when they get to Jerusalem and things aren't very easy to find the baby. They're pressed on. And I love this bit. Did you notice it? I'm sure you did. As they make this short journey from, it's not very far, is it? From Jerusalem to Bethlehem, it says these words. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. And actually Matthew uses three words to say, whereas the NIV only uses one. He says... They rejoiced with great joy. I love that. It's touching, it's uplifting. These men, these great men from afar, even though the place they come to isn't anything like a palace which you'd expect a king to be born in, they're filled with joy. And we sense a humble willingness for what God has purpose and a delight in seeing how he has brought them to the right place. It shows their faith, their confidence in what they've understood through the stars and confidence in the scripture that they heard in Jerusalem. And then, of course, we read how they saw the child and his mother and bowed down and worshipped. They knew what was called for in the presence of a little boy who looked something like David and Emma's little son. What faith, what obedience, what joy they show us. An example of how to respond to King Jesus, the saviour of the world. And they show us the only response that to Jesus that will be any good. The trouble with Herod was that threatened as he felt nothing would bring him to Jesus to honour and worship him. The trouble with the chief priests and teachers of the law was that their position and their traditions would never allow them to come to the baby king. Only the wise men saw that this was the only thing that mattered. They had to get to the newborn king, whatever it costs. And that's a message for us. So many things conspire to keep us from him. But coming to Jesus is the only thing that matters. Remember what he said later in his life, these famous words, come to me. As he said again, come to me, he said, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. On this last Sunday of the year, let's determine that nothing will stop us from coming to Jesus. If there's anyone here, or anyone watching, who's never come to him, then come now. Speak to him, call upon him, start trusting him to forgive you and bring you the rest he promises and the peace and joy of the wise men found. And if 
you already trust him. Be sure that the days ahead, that in the days ahead, you do not let anything stop you from coming to him moment by moment and day by day. In him, this is such a simple truth, but it is true. In him lies all we need. And in him we can daily find the peace and joy that we long for, even if our road is a weary one and the hardships are real. And in him we have hope. And isn't hope what the people of the world so desperately need at the moment? Let no threats, no traditions stop us from being beside him and knowing him more and more. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for sending our Lord Jesus as that baby in Bethlehem. And we pray that you will help us not to let our pride and self-sufficiency all the traditions that we've grown up with and which can sometimes seem so important stop us from coming moment by moment and day by day into the presence of our dear Lord and Saviour, the one who died for us, that one who was humble, born to die, and yet he gloriously God himself. Please, Make these things more real to us as we enter a new year shortly and keep us close to you, uh, coming again and again because we have in Jesus the one person who is the answer to everything we need. And we praise his name. Amen. Amen.
for well, um, we will have a Zoom coffee later on. And uh, do feel free to join the Zoom call on Wednesday. You'll be able to join, but uh, Emma and I won't be there. Um, but do just catch up with one another then. But let's finish with a closing blessing. May the God of peace himself sanctify us in time. And may our spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is faithful, and he will do this. Amen. Amen. Well, a joy to see you again, and may God bless you very much this coming week. See you soon.